panel. The title of this panel is Game Plan, How We're Tackling the Big Issues Together. So game plan, like what are you trying to do, and what about together? What about the collaborative side uh, nature of this? Um, Ann Carlson at Audience Left is going to, she'll set a good example here. What we'd like from each of our panels, just to get us started, is no more than three minutes on. Brief highlights of your biggest successes, your, your major issues and big successes with those issues. So you don't have to give us the history of your organization, but we want to know what you've tried to accomplish and give us some highlights of what you, what you have. And I give you Ann Carlson from the Colon Cancer Coalition. Ann. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. I know that your time is so valuable, and um, I hope that you're really learning to share your stories. It's our stories that connect all of us. We all have a path that led us here, and I'm super excited you, for you to share them with the lawmakers tomorrow and really, really create some change um, and keep that momentum going back in your home states. So I am Ann Carlson, Executive Director for the Colon Cancer Coalition. We're a national organization based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, yes, we still have snow on the ground, and um, we are dedicated to increasing screening rates. And to do that, we work in communities across the country. We hold runs and walks called Get Your Rear in Gear. We hold bike events called Tour de Tush. And golf events called Caboose Cup. So there is kind of a theme there as you're getting that. Um, and what happens is volunteers such as yourself and the med with the medical community uh, put on these events. And then we create programs. The gamut from increasing screening rates through the federally qualified health centers with fit testing, really working, you know, what Candace and had really touched on um, in Chicago, working with the underserved population, different ethnicities, really working on health literacy. We all know that that's a, that's a huge topic right now. Um, how do people receive care and making sure that there's equitable treatment for all? Uh, last year, we gave out over a million dollars in communities all across the United States. That's not, those are not pledge dollars, those are actual dollars that came because all of you raised all of that money. And uh, this year our goal is to give out one and a half million. Um, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, this is tough. This is a, the second deadliest cancer. All of us here and the panel before could really work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And unless we work together, um, we all have our different, you know, wheelhouses that we're good at. And when I have people come to us um, that want to do advocacy, we don't do advocacy. I, I have them call Angie and her team and, and vice versa. We work together. We've got a partnership with Colin Town. Um, they've got, you know, you'll hear from Erica. They've got thousands of people and she is so good at what she and her team are doing. And I research, you know, with Colon Cancer Alliance, you're putting so much into research, and, and it's great, and if someone wants to fund that, we send them there, and um, I'm, I'm so excited you are all here, and I, and I beg you to challenge us, ask your questions, um, coloncancercoalition.org if you ever need to get a hold of me or meet me at happy hour, um, but honored to be here and really in awe and humbled um, by what you all do and what you all go through. Thank you very so much, thank you. And we're going to follow up more on some of the things that you have accomplished singly mm -hmm. or, 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 or together. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Angie. So you've heard a lot about fight colorectal cancer already over the last couple of days, so I won't go into depth as it regards to what we do. But what I do want to talk about is why it's so important that we had these two panels. Um, fight colorectal cancer, I thought it was a great opportunity. It was sort of, call on Congress is sort of the UN, I felt like, of, of colorectal cancer. We have people from every single organization um, we cross-pollinate at Call on Congress. We learn a lot about what we're doing within other organizations and then in local communities. And what I also learned from our advocates is that sometimes they didn't know. What, what else is out there? You know, I'm, I'm really trying to find my passion. And part of being here at Call on Congress is finding your passion. And so we really wanted to showcase there are so many great organizations doing great work. Fight CRC is very focused on advocacy. We're very focused on research. But um, there are great groups that you can be doing things at home, and, and we're working with all our partners. So why not showcase the great work? So Thanks very much, Angie. And I think that helps highlight a point that we want to make here, which is 
as individual organizations singly, you have your respective missions and things we got to go out and do. But there are also things that you need to do, you want to do collaboratively. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of, it really is two sides of a coin that's uh, flipping in the right direction, as it were. You have to kind of maintain your own particular mission, but working together, you can accomplish more. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was well, well stated. Thanks very much, Andy. Well then, Erica. Well, I'm Erica Hansen Brown, and um, I met Angie at I think the first when I was a baby. call on camp. Well, and I wasn't. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm a patient, and I'm all about the patient initiating stuff and the patient-led stuff. And you know, when I was going through this disease myself, um, I had nobody to talk to. Nobody copped to knowing anything about colorectal cancer, and with all due, due respect to the longevity of Colon Cancer Alliance, there was nothing for me, and there was nothing for me with ACA or anything. Erica, you, when was this? You said there was nothing. When was that? 2003. So 15 years ago. Okay, right. There was so I'm there. Ned, 15 years, N-E-D, and everybody, that's a new word for you. I got it written down. Another new word. I got a yeah. list. I got a list over here. I dance with Ned. Okay. That's one of the things, and and everybody who knows me knows I do. But um, I was alone, and I and I went through some horrendous things, and I thought this is wrong. This is terribly wrong. So I created Colon Town because I knew it would attract other patients to a place called home. And what we've created in Colon Town, thanks to countless of you who are here who manage this whole thing. We manage, we have 81 secret groups on Facebook, each of which is dedicated to a specific topic uh, associated with having colorectal disease. That includes IBD, which can be a precursor, but um, it also includes my favorite, my favorite community, which is Analwise. That rolls off the tongue. It isn't CRC, but it's their cousins. And everybody knows that. So um, was there another piece of the question other than what well, I have already you've explained? You've already talked about some of the things. <laughs> you've already talked about some of the things you've accomplished, the highlights of those. I mean, one of those is obviously getting the thing off the run. Anything else that you can point to and say, and we have accomplished thus and so in recent years? Oh, well, we have probably accomplished more in getting more patients to clinical trials yeah, okay. than anything, any okay. other anything. And uh, we have educated more patients, and I would hazard to say, uh, I would hazard to say that because of being in Colon Town, a lot of people, thousands of people, are saying they're alive yeah. because of the discussions in Colon Town that they have learned from. So we're about education and connection. Yeah. No small accomplishment. Thank you very much, Erica. Trish. Um, I'm Trish Lannon. I'm the interim uh, president for the Colon Club, uh, which I got last year. <laughs> Phone call to school. Um, our organization was started in 2003 by Molly McMaster, who was diagnosed with colorectal cancer at the age of 23. Back then, much like um, Erica was talking about, there was really nothing that she could find of anybody her age. She was up in um, upstate New York, and she got um, a bug about you know trying to raise awareness, and created the Colon Club. And the whole purpose of the Colon Club was to connect those that were diagnosed under the typical age of 50 that were diagnosed with colorectal cancer or who were caregivers. And um, she came up with some phenomenal projects. Just recently, we retired one of our biggest projects, which was the original walk through colon. It was not a blow up. It was a full size, 40 foot long. Uh, we actually used it at one of your races. Um, it's, it takes an 18 wheeler, which is why we had to retire it. Um, Coco the Colossal, yay, yes. <laughs> um, so Coco has a home now at the Houston Medical Center or Medical Museum. Um, so if you're ever in Texas and Houston, check it out. You can actually crawl through it, pop through things, and it's got all the, it's anatomically correct. Um, it has, and it shows the different progresses through um, the, the disease. And we have received amazing pictures from schools, um, colleges, people who have gone um, that are learning for it. So Coco lives on in another kind of life. Um, she also, with her husband, our uh, then boyfriend, created Colon Talk, which at the time there was, there was no Facebook, because this is 2003, um, and created Colon Talk, which was an online, and still is, an online support group. 
Um, it is one of the things that got me through my treatment. It was the first thing I was able to find when I did the stupid thing and Googled what I was told in the emergency room that I had. Um, and I was able to very safely and privately ask questions and, and reach out for help. So we have that that um, is still very widely used, very popular. People really like that it's a very safe, nurturing environment where they don't have to, a lot of people aren't comfortable with having Facebook and social media. Um, so it's a much more private um, thing that you can um, look into. We also have um, a fund that um, we, much like when I talked with Sarah DeBoard this summer, it's sometimes you have money and it's amazing how hard it can be to give away um, we have something called the Kimberly Fund, and again, I'll say Sarah's name, touch base with Sarah, because she actually um, accessed the Kimberly Fund and, and went on a trip with her son to NASA. It is actually a fund that is set up to help those of you who have children, if you are in treatment or if you lost a partner and have a child, um, to be able to get away for a while and forget about cancer and go have some fun. Uh, right now, the, it's set at 1500 The board is trying to think about raising it, um, and you know the application is online at our website. We also have um, a blog that we are trying to um, get more interest in, and that's run by Leanne Sturgeon, so stop by and see her, and she can give you more information. But our biggest thing, obviously, is our retreat, which we like to call Colon Camp. Colon Camp, yes, woo-woo, Colon Camp. Um, Colon Camp is where we take um, 12 uh, survivors or caregivers and we basically provide them a safe nurturing environment to work on their social emotional health. And um, a little personal note on that, when we first had it, it was a calendar and as you guys heard earlier, Danielle and I met um, back in 2000, summer of 2008 when we were shipped up to some stranger's house in Lake George, New York, and we were convinced that we were not gonna be slashed and murdered or whatever. We went to totally like, okay, I'll come to your house at the lake, no problem, um, to people I didn't even know. Um, and you made connections, and if you touch base with my husband, Martin, he'll tell you that I left, I was six months out of treatment, and I left with a diagnosis that was telling me that I was gonna probably get to see one more Christmas. And when I got to colon camp, and then came home, my husband was like, who are you? Like I became a totally different person because I went to camp living to die. Mm. And when I got home, I was dying to live. Mm. I changed because I met people who were like me, who were 10 years out, five years out, some of them still going through treatment, wow. who I lived through their stories like Danielle's, that I was like, if she can do it, like I can do this. Like there, there is somebody out there for me so we now do the retreat in Tennessee. We have a very nice, generous person who owns something called the Five Star Retreat. Please check it out, give him some business. Um, he donates the cost of his place, which is $15,000 for a week, for $500, the cleaning fee. And one of our board members pays that cleaning fee every single year, it doesn't even come out of our donative money. And we take these friends, and I'm gonna, I, with permission, Diana Sloan, said I could share a story that I am still to this day touched by. Um, she, I'm gonna start getting upset. Um, we were in the pool doing a pool shoot, so if you look at the magazine that you have, there's a centerfold with, a, with them and they're, you know, we, the guy who owns the retreat, um, Greg, had a, what are those flying videos? Drone, drone thank you. Um, <laughs> so he's doing the drone and people are in the pool and we were trying to get the cover shot, which shout out to Riley, that's her. Um, that's my body goals. Um, but uh, Diana was in the pool and we wanted to get some different shots and um, Mark, our photographer, said, you know, I would love to have some people, does anybody here have an ostomy? Would anybody be able to, like, I want to do some underwater shots. He had a special camera and, and Diana all of a sudden said, I will. And I was like, oh, Diana will, Diana will. And she goes, no, you guys don't understand. I've never shown this to anybody, ever. And she goes, I must love you people if I'm about to show you Fred. <laughs> and I've never shown Fred to anybody. And I had to turn around and I was just like, that's, that's what this is about. And what breaks my heart is we don't have enough money to take more than 12. I would love to have more than 12 caregivers and survivors. We run 100% volunteer. 100% of our money goes to these projects. So this is another to-do on somebody's list, eh, I would think. Yes. Thank you very much for that. So, Michael? What can you add in so far as uh, highlights and so forth? 
Sure. Uh, Michael Sapienza, I'm the CEO of the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Thank you, Angie, for inviting all of us to be here. Um, so uh, my story actually started in 2006 when my mom was diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer. Unfortunately, she passed away in 2009 um, on Mother's Day. I was actually living in uh, Miami Beach, Florida as a professional musician, tremba player actually, um, and decided to move home about two months before she died. My brother said, you know, Michael, if you have a million dollars, you know, what, what would you do? Well, we didn't have a million dollars. I didn't have a million dollars. So um, I said, you know, I would start a colon cancer foundation, you know, similar to what, what Ann and, and Erica and others have said, you know, there weren't any huge organizations like Susan G. Komen, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, et cetera, that are galvanizing all of our energies mm -hmm. together to really go out and fight this disease. And so um, our family formed what was uh, then called the Christopher Life Colon Cancer Foundation. Uh, and then in 2016, we merged with the Colon Cancer Alliance, now the Colorectal Cancer Alliance. Uh, and we focus on three things. So one is research. Uh, this year we will fund a uh, very exciting a million dollars uh, worth of seed grants uh, for research, um, both in the young onset and in pre-disease uh, mechanisms. So we've pledged $3 million over the next three years in young onset this year. About 600,000 of the million will go to, to fund young onset grants to find out why we're seeing this increase. Um, our second program is our patient and family support program. So one of our biggest accomplishments was in 2016, we actually served 83,000 patients across the United States. And in 2017, we served 125,000. So really, really exciting navigating them, um, you know, for, throughout, throughout their journey. So whether this is, thank you, whether this is through Blue Hope Nation, our online community, whether through our six um, navigators with our helpline or our live chats, um, our financial assistance, we gave out about $200,000 last year. We're giving out about $250,000 this year, both in treatment assistance and in screening assistance. And then our third program is our prevention program. So the goal is to, to save 100,000 lives over the next 10 years. Um, we also have an un, a, a one run walk series similar to the Get Your Rear Gear and we give back locally. But we've decided to take a little bit of different approach this year and, and we're focusing on city by city. So this year we'll start in Philadelphia, investing over the next two years $4 million to see where, how quickly can we get the screening rate up to 80%. So. Okay, Matt, thank you. And Michael presaged my next question, which actually has to do with how are you individually and as a group pursuing screening toward 80%? And Angie, could you kind of start like, sure. it seems like it's a gen general goal, but how are each of you kind of pursuing that and what's the ultimate payoff? So for a fight colorectal cancer, as you've seen, we're an advocacy organization. So, you know, Nancy, who couldn't make it here today, I think she's really guided the organization and mission to say, you know, what are some systems change that we can do? Um, we're a team of 12, so we don't have the opportunity to have um, homegrown programs. So we work here in Washington, D.C. with our legislators. Um, we're, I'm part of the steering committee at um, the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. Andy Dwyer's on that steering committee as well. And so what we're really hoping to do is influence our leaders in the country around 80% by 2018. We were one of the first to pledge and support the 80% by 2018 goal, really seeing that as an opportunity to unite the country around a national mission um, to increase screening rates. And that grew to over 1,500 organizations that pledged the 80%. Um, I think that will continue to grow. I think when you see fight colorectal cancer be a part of something, we are pretty consistently collaborative. I mean, we, we recognize the breadth and depth that we can provide for this community. And what we've seen is partnership is, it just amplifies everything that we do. Um, we did launch the 80% kickoff event in LA, um, bringing together the Mayo Clinic, Fight CRC, Exact Sciences, UPS, and many others. Anne was with us um, in LA as well. And so that's sort of our approach as mm -hmm. it relates to how do we impact screening. We do work with local communities. Um, we do have expertise on staff, public health experts like Andy, who leads the um, lay navigation program out of the University of Colorado. So really looking at how can we disseminate best practices within our communities, um, and that's really sort of our approach to increasing. So is rates. it that everyone recognizes 80% as a goal, and you, only, and you take your own approaches to that to try to mm -hmm. achieve that? So then, if like for example, Erica through Colentown, I mean, how do you? push towards 
How could you contribute to that? Very little, except through collaboration with other groups. Because, ah. as I said, our focus is really on the patient experience. And uh, the nurturing within the community for one another. I mean, we are like almost 100% volunteer. Uh -huh. So we are patients helping other patients. The word disseminates out there, but there's no formal program. And we're really, I am, I've always been very pleased about the fact that this is about patients only and the patient experience. But it's greater patient appreciation of patient experience. Don't they, as patients, alert others to the need yes. to get screened? Yes, absolutely. And what bubbles up, what happens with Colon Town is every, all the ideas bubble up organically uh -huh. from the patients. So there are little efforts that people bring to me saying, I want to do something that will happen in this little community, whether it's local or in a disease-specific community, whether uh -huh. it's in Lynchville or Rechtelberg or <laughs> Big Apple Crew. I mean, I have a lot of different groups that have different focuses. And uh -huh. So yeah, it's about bubbling up and Got nothing it. formalized. We work with Angie and with Get Your Rear in Gear and anybody else about promoting the whole big picture. Got it, and how are you pursuing it? So screenings kind of um, really are our main thing that we do. So it really starts state by state, exactly how you are today. Um, we form round, round tables. Round tables are just a group of key stakeholders that have a vested interest in seeing the elimination of this disease. They typically have money, so you've got your HMOs, your insurers at the tables, your providers talking about messaging, your nonprofits. So let me stop you there. Yeah. That's a multi-stakeholder approach. You've got payers. It's not just, just it's, the patients and it's families. It's just, no, and the patients are at the table, the caregivers. Really, every single person in that state that has uh -huh. a vested interest in colorectal cancer uh -huh. getting out. Uh -huh. So it's you're solving the problem state by state. Then what happens is, so those are round tables. Then who's going to fund? Who, which hospital is going to pay for treatment? Which hospital is going to work on providing your mes messaging? What are the insurers going to kick in? And you know what? And you literally sit there pen to paper. Who's going to do so what? So the payers are at the table. They're right? always at the table. And they, it's as simple as who's going to donate space? Who's going to donate you know, stool tests? Who's going to you know, implement? We come in as a funder. So we come in and we fund. You can screen typically 1,200 to 1,500 people via stool test for about $20,000. Huh. That's not bad. Not at so all. So we're seeing about a 20% increase year to year by, by using this model through the community health centers. And you're really helping your, your population, your most vulnerable, vulnerable population so that needs it. It's bottom up. up. It is bottom. totally ground, ground up. Bottom. You're hiring patient navigators. Patient navigator is the heart of screening. What insights have you had about these sort of collaborative efforts? The hardest part is the numbers of the compliance numbers on stool tests aren't as great as we thought that they would be. So we've got to work harder to especially on the health literacy piece, training them how to how to take a good stool sample. Um, training in all the different languages and that's why to me the most pivotal role in increasing screening is the patient navigator. Uh -huh. Trish, anything to add on the, the achieving that goal of 80% screen? Well, what we do at Colon Club is really we focus on the story. So um, we, much like Erica, we are not set up to do right. the same things that some of these other organizations are doing. But with the Colon Club, what we do is we bring them in. They're telling our story. We're writing their story. We're putting their stories out. And then what typically happens is when we're sharing those stories and we're handing you a magazine or previously mm -hmm. a calendar, people usually see themselves in something or they see uh -huh. someone else or they see what they don't want to have happen or they go out and they get um, I've had so many people when I got sick I remember going for my first colonoscopy after I had colon cancer of course um, I went for my first colonoscopy and my GI doctor said I just want to thank you Trish and I said why and he said um, well I'm probably gonna be able to buy the beach house because literally every assistant <laughs> principal principal and teacher in this county has been in my office saying there's this AP who's like dying from colon cancer and I want my colonoscopy those are the stories and that's totally fine you know like yeah. that's that's why these stories are going out but mm -hmm. I rely on these folks to, to well, we've sort learned, of pass we've them learned to. a lot when you talk to folks who are experts in sort of knowledge translation and all that mm -hmm. they often emphasize that it's you need the stats, mm -hmm. but you need stories. You need a face. 
by themselves, mm -hmm. stories with faces, yeah. by themselves are only so suc uh, partially successful, but you blend them, you're gonna be much more successful. Right. Mm -hmm. Angie, on that point, thank you. So Kate. I wanna just add to that, because I think it's so important, these stories, and I think what the Colon Club is doing, what Colon Town is doing, and really the stories from Faces of mm -hmm. Blue, mm -hmm. I mean the stories from everyone that sort of has this library of story, because when the American Cancer Society did a market research study, 23 million people haven't been screened for colorectal cancer who are age eligible. This doesn't include those who have family history that, that should be screened earlier. Um, when they were asked, you know, maybe it's because they don't have insurance. That's not necessarily mm -hmm. the case. Many of them had insurance. Over half of them. Over that half had, had have insurance. insurance. And so when they were asked, they said, why? Because I don't have a sense of risk. So you are their sense of risk. They don't either know someone or have a friend who had cancer, not necessarily colorectal cancer, and those are the people that are hard to reach. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's really nice to be able to have a great place to go for really great stories so that other groups can leverage those stories to, to sort of nudge. Getting like to said. the yeah. unengaged, it's the hardest population right. to get to. And they don't, they don't have that impending need. Why should I do it? Especially, you guys, we've got to increase in the Native American population. Yeah. You're talking about 30% screening rate for men and about 50 for women. Why? You want to know why? why? Half of them say, I'm going to die early anyway. Oh. Do you know how sad that is? We have to do better. Yeah. Michael, anything you want to add in this goal of the 80%? I know you've been active in it. Yeah, and I, I think the only two things I would say, so one is, and Angie and I and the international group were talking about this on Saturday, is this 50 to 54 year old group, mm -hmm. right? And Why obviously, is that? Why is that? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't really know. I mean, their screening rate is 49.1% in this age group, 50 to 54. And so we wonder also then, you know, looking at the young onset group, you know, where are we going and where, you know, I know a mm -hmm. lot of you out there are asking, okay, so what's gonna happen with the screening age for us under 50? Well, American Cancer Society is looking at that right now, um, potentially, hopefully, fingers crossed, lowering that, that age, we should yeah. know I think late, late April, if that's, if that's gonna happen. And then the second thing I would say, so this gentleman, Lee Dranikoff, speaking of stories, so his wife was 45 years old when she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. He started like 25 companies and grown them to billions of dollars. So he's done a lot of this stuff. But so he, driving him crazy that he could not fix this problem with his wife. Mm -hmm. So she died March of 2016 and he came to us and he said, you know what, why can't we do what pharmaceutical companies are doing to treat this disease, but do it for prevention? Right, so what does that what does that basically mean? Is you know when Avastin is is unveiled, right? Most of you probably know what Avastin is, right? They spend between a quarter billion and a half a billion dollars to market that drug, right? Just half to market, just to market it. Well, if we could do that for colorectal cancer screening, with three hundred fifty mm. million dollars, we could almost get to eighty percent screening in one swell scoop, right? And that's part of the issue is it's like we need to have this groundswell of both, you know, dollars and information to be able to get this many people. Michael, screened. would that investment that you just cited be offset by savings later on in the healthcare system? Well, so that's what they're trying to do in HPV right yeah. now is do that groundswell. And it is hard because we just don't have the money. Yeah, so, it, so it, that's that one of the reasons why we're doing this hyper-locally, I mean, similar yeah. to what mm -hmm. you're doing, but on a larger scale in one city. Mm -hmm. So that $350 million divided by region, divided by city, Philadelphia has a 44 screening rate. We talked about this on Saturday, too, has a 44% screening rate. That is abysmal. 50% African-American population part of the, are part of the reason. With a $4 million investment in two years, quote, unquote, we potentially could get to 80% mm -hmm. screening mm -hmm. there. Wow, that's a goal. Uh, speaking of money, and oh, on that, finish up on that. You got a lot of talkers here. Actually, We're totally <laughs> on, on this point. You know, I love screening. So I just want to kind of take this back to Hill Day a little bit. <laughs> so, um, so for the CRCCP program, so to get two point five million dollar grants for local communities, it, that's why it's so important. So federal dollars helping public health facilities navigate patients and educate mm -hmm. patients about screening. That is what's going to be a spark plug for a lot of these communities. I think it's fantastic that foundations are supporting, you know, screening, but it's got to have a public health component into it to mm -hmm. help support and sustain it mm -hmm. as well. So just kind of bringing it back to Hill Day a little That's bit. That's a great example in the ways you've talked about trying Sorry. to alert people about screening in all your different ways should contribute to a common goal. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of expensive things, um, on your horizon, horizons, is something that could be another great big challenge, which is the whole field of immunotherapy and gene therapy starting to take off. I mean, 
with so-called more conventional chemotherapies, they're already pretty expensive. And we saw in a certain, another form of cancer, the so-called CAR-T therapy, mm -hmm. which was 475,000, which is apparently a bargain, they say. <laughs> Uh, and then gene therapies are gonna be a million bucks. Now they may be curative, or at least curative for a while curative, and maybe as high as $2 million. And we already heard from panel one about the terrible kind of financial burdens that, that, that are placed on people. Are you thinking ahead about this sort of new set of therapies and what it's gonna mean for advocacy for your organizations yet? It's just over the horizon, so they say. So, so yeah, one, Erica says uh, it's here. Michael, and then back to Erica. What do you got, Michael? Yeah, so, so one question I would say. So I don't know who, those of you that know Dr. John Marshall. I know Erica's mm -hmm. heard this before. But uh, two years ago, how many, how many people are on active treatment right now? Right? How many have a family member that's in active treatment or in it? Right? So one of the questions that Dr. Marshall asked at ASCO was how many people would take out their credit card, no matter what the cost would be, and would pay for their their or their loved one's treatment right then and there, right? And I think it's a really good question for us as, as advocates and as public health folks. Yes, they're too expensive, and yes, we have to work on the cost of drugs, but most P patients and their families, in the reality of it, would do anything, right? Say they would, and yeah. So anyway, I just think it's a really important mm -hmm. thing to start Erica with. Erica, on that issue? Well, uh, There's a research support side of it, and then there's a mm -hmm. how oh, do we pay for it side of it. I, I, I can't tell you how it upsets me because I'm talking to people, thousands of people, about going through this every day and and facing this every minute and, and looking for trials are an answer, mm -hmm. you know, on this one. And, I, and we're you know we're really big on educating the patient from the front door about the trial finder and get with it about knowing your MS status and your and the stuff you have to know about you and get with it about advocating for you, even when people don't necessarily want to hear that you at the front You need to get accepted case. into a trial? No, to even know what oh. they are even. I mean, there's such a gap. You know, the, the patient needs to know at diagnosis that they need to start learning about themselves mm -hmm. right now, not later on. Right. So that's my big push is Every new person that comes into Colon Town is being given a link to the trial finder and, and told that they need to tell us their MS status so that they can come to the proper Tom's Trials group to have the discussion about if they're MSS or if they're BRAF or if they want to learn about the CAR-T program. We've got about seven trials groups, actually. We have. Yes. We're in trials. But you asked mm -hmm. another question, and how do we deal with the people you know, how are people going to afford it? The only way that I can see clear for people to be able to afford it, unless they're inordinate, inordinately wealthy, and I don't know anybody who is, um, is to do a trial. That's, that's hope. That's not answering your question about how people are going to afford all of this. So getting into trials is one way to have access to these potentially mm -hmm. breakthrough yes. therapies. Mm -hmm. But if, it's, if you're in a trial, that means it hasn't been proven yet. So you're not so sure. Well, it's you might work. be taking you might be taking a risk. You're taking a risk with you're taking therapy. You are yeah. anyway. taking a yeah. risk with ah, any treatment. Okay. But where the the risks are, what's happening now, and, and we have people in this room who have done some of these trials, they're good today. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, we're really seeing something totally different than I so thought. So your main angle now, your main angle is figure out your status have access to information about trials. Mm -hmm. Learn, learn, learn. learn. Give enrolled. them all the tools that learn, they learn, need learn. to make an educated decision. Got connect, it. connect, connect. Know who the docs are. Uh, know everything you possibly can. And talk to other people that are experiencing. Learn from them as well. That's what we provide, a place where those conversations can take and place. And what's good and about that learn. is that information gets them. We all think that everyone lives in big city with access to, you know, all the big hospitals right there. It's not true. We have a huge, huge population that lives in rural America. You heard that in panel one. Did, yeah, yeah wow. huge, huge. Yeah. And so what's what's nice about Colon Town is they can get those questions. When you're diagnosed, and especially as a caregiver, everything, your whole world stops and you have a million questions you can't even answer and, and don't begin even to your think about. You don't know what you don't know. <laughs> What's nice about Colintown is you can ask any of these questions 
and someone will give you an answer because it's usually three in the morning when you can't sleep and you're in pajamas and you have this burning question. It's not a nine to five thing. Right. And so that's what's great about it. Are these are people that have been through it. So they can really walk alongside the journey and answer the questions about immunotherapy, what's good for this type of cancer, what's good with different clinical trials, what luck have you had? Are people sufficiently networked to kind of access folks? I mean, the impression I get sort of is, I've had experiences with other forms of cancer, not this, but that this type of cancer has people that speak directly. Yeah. They All of the vocabulary, these, people honesty, that, they're the ones yeah. that honesty, connect everybody. Blatant, Authentically, blatant yes. Blatant honesty. Yeah is what I see here. And so can people access those blatantly honest folks? Yes. Any oh, yes. yes. Oh, it, absolutely. Yeah. And okay. so, you know, everyone in this room, you are now messengers of, you know, colorectal cancer. You were yeah. already. We talk about it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We talk about your poop. You talk about polyps. Right. Talk about have you been screened? Did your relative have a polyp that was benign or malignant? We talk about it all the time. Are, are you MSI? And are it you just, MSS? It just connects, yeah. keeps connecting the people. Wow. And we tell them where to go. Angie, and I, thank you. So, and I think this is, I mean, a great discussion because I think it highlights what we do and what we do differently as well mm -hmm. um, and how we learn from each other. I know for Colon Town, I, I joined the clinic. So I, I was able to watch some discussion. Our team is really focused on understanding the science to help patients therefore understand the science as well we blog we have mm -hmm. webinars we have our staff going to ASCO GI ASCO and the reason why we invest in that is because you know when you get diagnosed with colorectal cancer we all know you don't get a PhD and an MD that comes with that right. it's very hard and I think sometimes you know our role or at least how we see our role is to help kind of filter some of that information. Mm -hmm. So what's practical for me? What's relevant for me right now? What's gonna be relevant for me maybe down the line? And what should I be watching for? Because I know a lot of you here who are thinking about clinical trials, you have to think about it four deep. So mm -hmm. not just the first trial, but the second trial, the yeah. third trial, Strategy. the fourth trial, and then who, where do I need to go? So do I, do I go to MD Anderson? 80% of cancer patients are in community practices. Mm -hmm. And community practices want to retain their patients. But I know that with the advent of Colon Town, with private groups, with chat rooms, mm -hmm. with the internet, Dr. Google, I mean, people are wanting to see where to go. Yeah. And so, you know, our role, we really feel like, is to help distill some of that information because it's mm -hmm. so overwhelming. Yeah. So, go ahead, Michael. No, just one, one other thing I would add is I think. The, one of our main issues, and Angie, you were kind of touching on this, but is how do we reach the masses, right? So our organizations in general, if we're talking about clinical trials, we're talking about MSS status, so only about 40% of metastatic patients are getting their MS, MS status checked in any setting, which is, which is insane. And then if you look at the numbers that each of our organizations are reaching, we're talking about in the thousands. And in terms mm -hmm. of the number of patients that are living in this country, we're talking about over a million. Mm -hmm. So I think one of our collective challenges is how do we reach more people? Mm -hmm. How do we educate and advocate for more, way more peop people? I, I have a little quick story on this okay, one. Okay. Last, last summer, I went to one of the rollouts of across the country that one of the organizations sponsored about immunotherapies in the major cities they did it. And I went to the one in New York. and. From the panel, from the DS like this, the docs were sitting up there. There were local, I remember the one from UPenn, who was lamenting the fact that the patients, this was billed for patients, and, and he was lamenting the fact that the patients weren't signing up for trials. And afterwards, I went up to him and I buttonholed him a little bit and I said, I just want to know, because I'm dealing with patients one on one, what are you guys doing to inform them? right there about what they need to know about themselves. And he almost fell down <laughs> because I was going like this with him. And he said, nothing. Maybe that was an honest answer. It was a very honest answer. And I said, well, you guys need to do something. I think that's where our work is really, I mean, there's a huge gap there in the, their understanding of, what, of who we are. And, it's partly our fault, it's partly their fault, the system's fault. Somebody, we have to get through this because we need to know this stuff about ourselves from the get-go to save our lives. Good gosh. Well then, let's take that to a practical next step. And that is, we've heard a lot about the successes, your various initiatives and so forth. As sort of a strategic look ahead, as a strategic look ahead, what do you think 
are your joint priorities for collaboration? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it starts with what you're doing tomorrow on the Hill, I don't know, but when you think ahead about what needs to be done, not as individual organizations, but together, what would those priorities comprise? I think Terrific. that um, what I've, you know, since taking over what I've been working on with uh, my partner Susie, is that we need to do a better job uh, Angie keeps using the, the word this week, um, uh, cross-pollination. <laughs> and I, 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 I've, I've been talking about like building the bridges. Um, and I believe Ann mentioned this earlier too, is about how we are not, I can't do what Michael does. I, we're not set up that way. That's not why we do what we do. I don't do what Erica does, Angie does. What it, but what we offer at the Colon Club, I can then, this summer we asked Colon Cancer Coalition and Fight CRC to come out to the retreat. And our survivors and caregivers were there. So they join you in your event. They, they join came each other's event. Right, they mm -hmm. came to our event. So Michael Sola from uh, Fight CRC was there and Sarah DeBoard from Colon Cancer Coalition Yay! were there. And um, <laughs> one of the nights, so what I wanted them to do is to see what we did. That there wasn't, it wasn't like a big secret. Like I, I, I come and see what we do. I don't think anybody's going to steal anything. It's that's just I think ridiculous. Like a competitive thing that needs to go away. Com, mm -hmm. com, uh, in my opinion, we have enough things fighting you. There's yeah. enough. Yeah. yeah. We need. Mm -hmm. yeah. We need to play. As uh, Stephen and I were talking the other night, we need to play well in the sandbox. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't believe any of these people up here are going to take anything away from what we do, nor do I believe that we would ever take away anything. I think that we actually raise each other up. Mm -hmm. So when um, Michael and Sarah came, I was really cautious about like how much time I like carved out for them because I didn't want the survivors and caregivers to think that they were losing out of their time on the retreat and things like that. What turned out to be scheduled for an hour lasted two to three hours, and then those conversations actually, and if you talk to Michael and Sarah, those conversations continued over the next couple of days on private levels where people pulled them aside. And what happened was is we take care of their social, emotional wellness, and we mm -hmm. create a family for them, and we create an environment where they have um, support and love to get through the difficult times. And then what these organizations did is they set them up for the advocacy piece. They learned mm -hmm. about the um, resources that- So something flowed from this. Yeah, mm -hmm. that the Colon Cancer Coalition had resources that they could reach out to and we've had some of them go out and volunteer. They speak at our, um, at our Get Your Rear and Gear events and just get tre uh, tremendous. The, um, the emails that we get afterwards and the impact that they have on these lives is unbelievable. Yeah, and, and with Angie's group, with Fight mm -hmm. CRC, you know, th I mean, they're all here. I, all 12 were supposed to be here. Unfortunately, three of them ended up, well, two of them ended up back in the treatment and one something mm -hmm. else. But they all came here, and every year when we bring people here, the first thing they say to me is, I'm so coming back next year. This sucks you in. Mm -hmm. It gets them going with their advocacy. We taught them to, to own their story to live their story, not be afraid to speak out. Don't be embarrassed about having an ostomy mm -hmm. or a urostomy or a nephrostomy or you know, whatever the issue is. And then they build them up for advocacy and Colon Cancer Coalition gets them out there to continue to share their story and, and, and get that volunteer. So that's the cross-pollination. Mm -hmm. it, it lights a fire. So what are the issues though? What are the priority <laughs> issues that can be addressed by the cross-pollination. Well, and we the, have to, oh, and, oh and, actually, and, I just, what, I never stop talking. Issues? Really, the big thing that we're all working on and together is the early adult onset. Um, we've got to figure out the high, the how, you know, are they getting an earlier form yeah. um, of the one that they're getting 50 and older? Are so they could getting, even be a biological. Could be a, a completely different wow. one. Um, wow. Are they getting a different form? I, we've got the summit coming up in April that we're all working on. We're working on messaging. You know, mm -hmm. what are those critical messages that you would have seen at 22 years old that said, wait, that could have been me? Blood in the stool, wait, that could be colon cancer? But I'm 22. So we need to change the conversation and we're all working mm -hmm. on that. And then really just learning from each other, the tools, the conversations. We cannot be experts in everything and we cannot pretend to be experts in everything. Uh -huh. And so we really do, we have each other's cell phones, we text, we call. You know, who, what's going on here? What's going on so in that city? you do have the means, the ready means to get in touch with each oh, other gosh, right yeah. away. We, yeah. Okay. Between, yeah. Also between that, the first panel and the second panel, we all work together Got it. consistently. And what's nice Good. is they reach out, like Michael has reached out to me about, you know, their, their organization, well, 
their offshoot Never Too Young because that's the focus of my organization. Yep. Mm -hmm. Angie might reach out to me because of something. And so they all know, uh, I don't have the expertise that Michael has or mm -hmm. his, his mm -hmm. organization has, but yet we can still work together to get the information out there or to feed off of like, so what have you heard and what do you, what's going on in ah, your community? So like the intelligence out there you're gathering. Yeah. Or a survivor. We might find someone that's in the communities that they're in. Um, and so we, right. we want to connect them. Got so it. then we'll call and say, hey, Michael, can you help this person? Right. Well, Michael, yeah. what are those issues out there? Anything you want to add about the things that you have to think about going after next collaboratively? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at, uh, what I do is I look at, let's look at other disease states, right? So pancreatic cancer, um, leukemia and lymphoma. We all talk about breast cancer, right? We all want blue to be the new pink, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, is how do we collectively have the impact of someone like a $400 million Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, a $250 million Susan G. Komen, a $40 million Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. And I just wanna say, all three of these disease states have less, a lower mortality rate than colorectal cancer. You're, you're higher up on the, right. not, they're all terrible conditions, but you have a greater- For the second deadliest cancer behind lung. prevalence, mom. yeah. Right, so, so the question is, how do we collectively get to a place where we have the same impact and the same type of groundswell, grassroots action that those sorts of disease states have. So right? that's a, you know, I'm just thinking and, again, yeah. this and, is, yeah. a comp, it, it, it's a Washington thing, but when you go to the Hill and you talk to policymakers and gatekeepers, they always wonder, well, how big a problem is this? And it seems what you've it's just a said. Problem. It's a public health crisis. But just yeah. The problem is yeah. bigger mm -hmm. than the funding that you're using. Oh, gosh, yeah. That relationship is not the same as in the organizations that you just outlined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, let, let's, let's just put it this way. There's a couple things going again, uh, against us, right? We have a stigma, right? Colorectal yeah. cancer, people don't want to talk about it. 30 years ago, people didn't want to talk about breast cancer. So that's a huge thing in oh, terms really? of, you know, you heard me talk about money a minute ago, and sometimes we don't want to talk about that. But to get research done, to do advocacy, to support patients, to pre you know, prevent this disease, we need money, right? Got and it. some of those diseases, like breast cancer, has used that sort of groundswell from a marketing standpoint mm -hmm. to help create a grassroots campaign to raise mm -hmm. money. Excellent, thank you very much. Why don't we go to Q&A at this point? And uh, please raise your hand if you've got a good question. I see one right there already. <laughs> and remember what we said, uh, please no speeches uh, disguise as questions. And your name, please. Hi, I'm Danielle. Thank you. My <laughs> so I'm going to put my patient hat on because here's something I hear a lot from you guys in the room, like, what can I do? Like, I'm not doing enough. So I thought it'd be helpful if um, we could hear with each of the orgs, you know, as a room full of people impacted with your organization what can I do you know can I write can I run can I sing I don't, I don't know so I thought okay. it'd be interesting like really practical <coughs> verbs of what we can do and name one thing maybe two of it's great about what we can do these are to do things and just specific for our org yeah yes, oh okay for your org. get involved in your local get your get your rearing gear event um, form all right Start your own Get Your Rear and Gear event. Email me, Ann at colancancer.org. <laughs> That's great. Angie. Um, when you get a petition, please sign it. Get your <laughs> friends and family to sign it. Get to know your members of the Congress. That's my pitch. Okay, good. Erica, what do you got? Amazing. <laughs> um, well, we're really new and really young in this whole world, believe it or not. And, and uh, organizationally, I've run this thing, but increasingly we've got like 50 odd people that are really managing all these different groups. And so I've just the other day come up with an organizational chart that shows a path to how to help. Mm -hmm. And it's through community management. Okay. Um, and we are about to have our first official train the trainers here in DC and we're inviting a very few people to come and we're going to we're going to harvest the best practices that they have discovered in volunteering with us mm -hmm. and we're creating a handbook that is going to be the talk of the nation you guys wait oh. and people are going to be able to use that Let's in building the nation. you know continuing to build the community and building more community so you're going to first absorb best practices consolidate them, them yes and then disseminate it back out through training then we'll trainers. train more people 
Got these it. trainers will train more people. We'll, we'll, have, a, we'll have a training machine. So like what this. can people here do to get involved with you? Yeah. Join Colon Town, first of all. See yeah. what it, the experience is all about and see where you fit within the whole structure. And then if you want to help us, raise your hand. Mayor at colontown.org or everybody knows they can PM me. So. Got it. Trish, what do you got? Um, well, one of the things is, you know, obviously you can apply to come to Colon Camp. Unfortunately, we don't have the money to send a lot of people, but that's something you could do. He wants you to have but a lot more money. The whole <laughs> She's going to ask for, for yeah. money gonna, next. Yeah, I'm going to ask for money. That's okay. Oh. There's a dance tomorrow night. I'll get you. Um, <laughs> Um, we, what we would like you to do is share your story. That's where, that's the basis of what we do is the story. We have a blog. You can reach Leanne at leanne at colonclub.com or you can email me at trish at colonclub.com. Um, we want stories because, and it's not just about your colon cancer or colorectal cancer story from beginning to end. It may be something people need to know, for example, when they're under the age of 50, if they're still at the age where they're dating, what, what do you do? when you have an ostomy and you are still trying to find a partner? What do you do when you have children? What do you do as a caregiver when you've lost a partner and now you've got to raise a child by yourself? Those are the issues that they want to hear. Share your stories. I know that they're intimate, but I'm telling you, that connects people and then that helps people. And I can't tell you how many times the people who do have the, the strength and the courage to share their different stories how much that makes a difference in someone else's life. Share your stories. Now, it sounds like all of your organizations have some sort of avenue by which to share a story. Mm -hmm. There are different yeah. ways of doing it. Michael? Yeah, the only thing I would add for, for us is just, you know, going back to your local community and talking to people, right? I mean, it's not, it's not uh, mind-blowing, but I'll tell you, the last four weeks, um, we've been on TV or done radio interviews with four different people that have never, they've had colorectal cancer for two or three or four years, and they've never wanted to tell a single soul, mm -hmm. even their friends, their wow. family, right? And we really approach this as how do we try to get people that aren't comfortable talking about it to be out there talking about it. Got it. Thank you. Next question, gentlemen here, name. Please, question short, answers concise. Uh-oh. Short. My name is Roy. I, I want to ask a question that, that uh, takes up the point that Trish raised about collaboration versus competitive. And when I look at this panel and the panel before, I keep thinking, is this the Justice League movie where we have a bunch <laughs> yes. of superheroes? Or is it the Avengers where we have, again, superheroes with all these different powers coming together to collaborate? So how do we get to Michael's point, which is getting past that critical threshold where this becomes, instead of just talking amongst ourselves, that we're really reaching the masses Michael gets and making it a, a, a common Cross the critical threshold, Michael? Yeah, so just quickly, three years ago, 2014, the beginning of the year, Christopher Life, Colon Cancer Alliance, I went to their board chair, who we were frenemies, whatever you want to call, call it, uh, organizations were frenemies, and I said, you know, look at about the impact that we could do if we work together, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the impact. And, and we went to a board meeting, Erica, I think you were at this board meeting, Christopher Life board meeting, that you know everybody on the most people on the CRISPR Life board were like, well, we're going to lose our name. Chris is 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 our namesake, and you know there was all these ego pieces involved. And my dad, who was the board chair at the time, stood up and said, "This is about the greater good and about the impact in our community, and let's move forward." And it was really this mm -hmm. thing where you know we came together and, and kind of moved past it. Thank you very much. I'm going to take two more questions, please. Short questions next, and there's one over here on the microphone, lady uh, beside. Quickly. Yeah. Well, let's everybody answer their question. Um, anyways, like Chris is saying, how do we get, like everybody is good, tell your stories and, and talk to Congress, but it needs to funnel down to the nurse practitioners and mm -hmm. to, we, mm -hmm. I mean, like literature, like walking in and dropping off literature to say you're never too young. Mm -hmm. I'm on the advisory board for Never Too Young right now, okay. and I know there's something in process, but I don't know if it's come together yet. I haven't heard that information. How do we funnel it down to Angie, hand it to these people that need it? Thank so you, I might Angie. not be answering your question directly because we sort of approach it a little bit differently, but I, I get where you're going with it. Um, but I do want to share this story because I think it speaks to the bar larger impact. Brief on story. <laughs> I can't, I can't, this one I can't. I'm so sorry, Claire. Do your best. I'm sorry. Do I feel like it's best. a party. I can <laughs> 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 
Try so the, the reason why I want to tell the story is because I think it's really important in how we approach it, like as Fight CRC. Is that, so WellPoint, are, is anyone familiar with WellPoint? They're mm -hmm. a payer group. They have m yeah. multiple millions of lives that are covered. So one way that we approached it was we recognize they have clinical pathways. Clinical pathways is a buzzword here in DC. A lot of people are talking about clinical pathways. It impacts patients directly. So it's an important word to know. Um, and the treatment that patients get. So by CRC, we know we can't go to doctor, to doctor, to doctor, to hospital um, and change how they're treating patients. But we have the expertise and we have the network of physicians that are influencers. Many of you go see these physicians. But Dr. Leonard Salt said, well, you can get the medical director of WellPoint to meet and do a conference call and we go point by point on the clinical pathways, I'd be willing to be on that call. Okay. So Fight CRC found the medical director, at the time it was Jennifer Malin, she took our call, we set it up, we met point by point, we changed the clinical pathway for WellPoint as it related nice. to colorectal cancer. That's not something you probably we will see you know, on our Twitter feed or on mm -hmm. our Facebook posts, but I think that for us, it's not, it's not just purely awareness, because I think awareness is very, very important. But for us as an organization, it's making sure we're at the tables where decisions are made, yep. mm -hmm. either by a payer or by a research community or by the FDA. And that's really just something I don't want to lose sight of. I think that everyone yep. here is, very, is doing great work. Um, and that we all sort of are united around some of these bigger issues as well. Clinical pathways really are a gatekeeping mm -hmm. function that is essential mm -hmm. to the deciding who has access when and how. Mm -hmm. No small point. Last question from the floor. Okay. Brief question. Yeah, I think I think I get it. Um, first of all, <laughs> as a patient, I want to personally and probably speak for all the patients and caregivers in the room to uh, thank each one of you individually for all of your hard work and dedication. <laughs> Thank you. And, and the panel before, but really to have the five of you up on here on stage together means so much uh, to the patients and to the caregivers. So to that point, um, knowing all of what you all do for us, um, what is the one thing that we could do for each of your organization? And is it okay? Um, I don't want to say okay, maybe that's not the right word, but but I think uh, we, we want to do for all of you, and, 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 is, and can we, and how can we? Maybe you know, in one word or you know, a brief sentence, how could we give back to you? Anyone want to take a, a, a go at that? Ann, what do you got? For me, uh, it's sharing your story with people that do not, that the unengaged, we all have to get to the unengaged. And the other thing I want to say is, it's okay to love all of us. Mm -hmm. We never want you to feel like, oh, God, I, that org and that org. And yeah. we, we're all together. So please never feel guilty. Wear your shirts and your hats, and you can represent all organizations because it is about all of you. Excellent. But it's really getting to those, or, those people that don't know about colorectal cancer, average risk people. Thank you, Ann. Angie. Um, Stick with your passion. Find your passion up here in the panel before, mm -hmm. but stick with us. Thank you, Erica. Excellent, Erica. Oh, golly. Uh, <laughs> support, you know, get the patients. I felt so alone. Reach out to everybody about colorectal cancer. Don't be afraid of saying colon, rectal, rectum, <laughs> anal. You know, encourage people to be authentic. And because it's healthy, it's healthy yeah. for them. But let them know that we're here for them. And get your, get your friends and neighbors and everybody else into the organizational stream and they will become one of us. Use your words as it were. Trish? <laughs> um, for me and for the Clone Club, I think the key word here is be brave. Don't be afraid, speak up, share your story. Um, there are definitely people out there like you, and just like I say when I was a teacher, you know, the, when you always have a question and you're afraid to raise your hand because you think you're going to look stupid, nine times out of ten, I guarantee there's someone in that class that has the same question and they're worried about the same thing. Don't go. worry about looking stupid or being embarrassed. Be brave, <laughs> and I'll leave you with one last thought from us, but I have an addiction with Dr. Seuss, but one of his um, quotes that gets me through some of this is that if someone doesn't care a whole awful lot, Nothing is going to change. It's just not. Thank you, ma'am. 
And Michael, thank you, Trish. Michael. So about five hours ago, um, I learned of the passing of a good friend, Julia Williams, uh, 41 years old, stage four patient. And when I think about her, I think about determination. I think about being fierce. Mm -hmm. I think about honesty. honesty, hope, but not hope, <laughs> dying, but dying gracefully. gracefully. Um, and I think that you know our entire community, and you know Angie, thank you again for bringing all of us together. Um, you know, really, really needs to come together to fight this disease as one. Thank you. In a moment, I'm going to turn it. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back to Julian in a second. Before that, though, I think you see five exemplary leaders here that have built organizations, taken the leadership to make them what they are individually, but they just, I think, committed to you how collaboration is going to make them all even more successful. Thank you, Ann, Angie, Trish, Mike, and, and all of you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Erica. Thank you all for such a wonderful panel, and thank you, Cliff, for moderating. It was really fantastic. So just really quickly, because they are going to kick us out of this room.